Racing is a primal pursuit. You are either the hunter or the hunted. Success and survival is about learning faster and managing change better than your competition. As 1975 began, I was focused on bringing change as part of a new team behind the second chance for Formula Magazine. Competition for readers and ad dollars was fierce coming out of the energy crisis of 1974, so we had to learn fast. Now 20, I was also focused on earning enough to run my newly acquired Eldon Formula Ford. That was my second chance at racing. I was also hard on equipment and now driving my fourth road car in barely 15 months. My dreams were becoming reality. I was now commuting to a real job in Santa Ana, California, home of Dan Gurney's All-American Racers. But one week after I started, death rained down from the skies above my hometown of Whittier, California, as 14 lives were lost in a mid-air collision. On that horrible night, I realized all I really have is the eternal now. One of my inspirations was former Eldon Formula Ford racer Tony Bryce, who was ready to enter Formula One. I was also excited and proud that American racers Mario Andretti and Mark Donahue were now both full-time in Formula One. And my Formula Ford hero, two-time world champion Emerson Fittipaldi, was the man to beat. Formula's owner, John Benton, was now focused on making it successful. He was also running his Lola T330 in a full season of SCCA Formula 5000 from the same building where we would work. My name was on the masthead as managing editor and art director, and I was energized by two more top American teams in Formula One. Roger Penske and Parnelli Jones were in it to win it. So was I. This was my first issue without my pal Mike Van Adder as art director. With an increase from 24 to 32 pages, Formula Magazine could now have large images that showed racing's beauty. But my interest was really in new Formula Fords, like the Crosley 30F, that I saw at the local dealer where I met rising star B.J. Swanson. The March issue came quickly with on-deadline coverage of the 6th California 500 at Ontario Motor Speedway. We also ran reports on SCCA races such as the Riverside National. And my friend Richard Shirey won the Formula Ford race in his ADF Mark II against a huge field that included six current and future IndyCar racers. My client, Paul White, was also running Team AD for Tom Whiteman and ADF designer David Bruns. I was truly inside the sport and now learning and growing every day. But 6,000 miles from Santa Ana, California, as team members hustled to bolt guardrails together that the organizers failed to do, Formula One's racers threatened to strike, but only Emerson Fittipaldi chose not to race. But the 1975 Spanish Grand Prix started regardless, amid a sense of dread and impending doom. After 24 laps, the rear wing broke on race leader Rolf Stomlin's Embassy Hill Lola Ford. And his brutal impact and breach of the unsafe barriers echoed around the world. Four spectators were killed. The race was stopped four laps later. Stomlin survived, but with multiple broken bones. Fittipaldi's McLaren teammate, Jochen Moss, was declared the winner, while Leila Lombardi finished sixth the first and still only woman to score a Formula One World Championship point. Tony Bryce finished seventh in his F1 debut driving for Frank Williams, but he would soon benefit from Stomlin's misfortune by replacing him on Graham Hill's team. Three days later, far greater chaos and tragedy unfolded on the other side of the planet. Those fleeing were now coming to my world, just as something else was coming to my world thanks to my hero, Dan Gurney. Formula previewed a game-changing street race coming in September to Long Beach, California. That was the vision of Dan's collaborator, an expat Brit named Chris Pook. The circuit would wind around downtown Long Beach near the arena where I'd watched Dan's friend and teammate Jim Clark win the 1965 Indy 500 live on closed circuit TV with my father. Now a decade later, Dan would make his 14th attempt to win the Indy 500, but this time as a team owner. And for a moment, we will all be back home again in Indiana. And home again in Indiana. And it seems that I can 
The best rain shower of my young life came on lap 174 of 200. So here comes your victor. Splashing down for victory lane. I have never in my life seen this kind of an end to an Indy 500. There's your winner, Bobby Hudson. Dan Gurney, your car just won the race. <laughs> Oh, my. <laughs> Bobby Unser, you've just been trying to talk to him on the mic. He's up there somewhere. No, he's up there. He said, is that it? I said, you bet it is. That's fantastic. This is your first win as a team and Bobby's second win. Oh, we're perfect proud. This is a great moment for Dan Gurney. I'm very happy for Dan because he's so loved around the world. As I said earlier, he's been a great ambassador. To win the Indy 500 must be a really a dream come true for him. A great race, but what conditions? But the month of May had been less kind to my hero Mark Donahue as he struggled at Monaco with the uncompetitive Penske PC-1. Producing the June issue exposed me to the horrors of the Spanish Grand Prix. I was immature and looking for an escape, so soon my time, money, and focus were spent on foolish distractions. And at every Malibu, you can get behind the wheel of a Formula race car and race against the clock. Malibu Grand Prix, day or night, for the thrill of it, yeah! the games in it, <laughs> the fun of it. it. Malibu. With the July issue, I was once again making mistakes. At least I was consistent. Thankfully, something above our world reminded me that dreams require commitment to become reality. Moscow is go for docking. Houston is go for docking. It's up to you guys. Have fun. All righty. Sounds good. Palomino Mila, Alexei. 140 miles above the Atlantic near Portugal. During their two-day joint flight, astronauts and cosmonauts transferred between spacecraft. The mission climaxed more than three years of planning and preparation, a time during which differences in language, in technology, in political creed were set aside. Ron Fanner's spirit was guiding me back to my destiny in the insanely dangerous sport that had me under its spell, as the chaos continued at the British Grand Prix. He is coming into the pits. Emerson Fittipaldi, the leader, is coming into the pits. He's on the pit lane, and look, we've had an accident, a multi-car accident, and James Hunter spun and crashed into the other car. He's crashed into the car, number 19, who, of course, is Morgan. There's a few. Jody's in there. Jody's crashed as well. He's come out of it. And there's another car, Wilson Fittipaldi. This is aquaplaning. Emerson Fittipaldi is leaving the pits. There's the car number 28, the first National City Bank car of Mark Donahue. He's okay, he's getting out of the car. And it looks as though they are stopping the race. And Emerson Fittipaldi will undoubtedly in that situation be declared winner. Meanwhile, my friend Richard Shirey was winning everything in his ADF Mark II Formula Ford, which made me want to race even more. With August came my 21st birthday and a promise to myself to start racing before the end of 1975. On the one-year anniversary of President Nixon's resignation, Mark Donahue and Roger Penske were on a mission. The world Mo's course record belongs here in Alabama. One lap round the oval faster than anyone's ever dared before. For America's quiet, courageous Mark Donahue, it would be one of the most serious challenges in his famous career. In 1974, A.J. Boyd bombarded the high banks, blitzkrieging the record by 16 miles per hour. Boyd averaging over 217 miles per hour for one lap in his own car. A $175,000 car robs to life, and an Earth astronaut seeks out his own horizon. Roger Penske considers the next. You're running at such tremendous speed for the difference between 217, which is Boyd's record, and 220, which we're shooting for, is two tenths of a second, and it's 2.6 miles, so that's not very much. Darning, dodging the most difficult obstacles, the unseen, the unknown. Mark Donahue established a new world record mark in Alabama, 221.160 miles per hour. But this moment was Mark Donahue's. 
Their relentless ambition motivated me to keep pushing myself, but this triumphant moment was fleeting. It would soon be overshadowed by the events at the Mid-Ohio Formula 5000 race the following weekend, where many I knew were racing. At the start, B.J. Swanson's throttle stuck wide open. He died two days later from his injuries. B.J. was just 26 years old. Five days later, Mark Donahue crashed his new March 751 when a tire failed on the morning of the Austrian Grand Prix. A marshal was killed and another injured. Although Mark initially seemed uninjured, he died two days later from a cerebral hemorrhage at the age of 38. I felt a profound sadness and realized that choices have real consequences. That week, I considered my future as I drove north to Sears Point Raceway for another Formula Ford weekend with our Formula Magazine crew. With the September issue came two obituaries for racers at opposite ends of their careers. I took comfort in drawing a concept illustration of a new David Bruns designed racing car that also foreshadowed my future. As the first Long Beach Grand Prix weekend began, I met our F1 correspondent Jeff Hutchinson, but my lasting memory of the day was seeing Dan Gurney's Eagle driven by Vern Schumann be the first car on the new circuit. The Long Beach Grand Prix had gone from an impossible dream to a vibrant reality that would soon play a defining role in my life. Tony Bryce led brilliantly as his F1 team owner Graham Hill looked on from the press room while we both watched the race unfold. But it was defending F5000 champion Brian Redman who won the inaugural Long Beach Grand Prix. And this was also the only day my mom, Val Fanner, ever attended a race. In early October, the IROC series inspired my fifth set of wheels in two years. Climb into a 76 Camaro. Camaro is a driver's car that feels as good as it looks. A lift, America, not just a ride. My Camaro was blue on blue and it smelled like warm plastic. Working on formula was improving my design and illustration skills quickly, but I wanted more. Skip Barber's dream of launching a racing school had become reality in less than a year, which motivated me to think bigger. The weekend before Halloween, I went to a concert at Dodger Stadium, but my mind was on racing, not music. Five days later, Team AD's Tom Weichman won the SCCA Formula Ford Championship, so I stopped dreaming and started doing. I registered for an SCCA driver's school in an abandoned World War II airbase 20 miles north of the Mexican border. It was time to finally begin my racing adventure, until I spun in my own oil when the valve cover came loose due to my abysmal mechanical ability. Then came the shocking news that Graham Hill, Tony Bryce, and three teammates had perished in a plane crash. I was again confronted with the uncertainty of life and the certainty of death. Formula Magazine had been my priority, and it was working. But in 1976, I wanted to find out if I was a racer before it was too late.